Introduction to Pathology Etiology, Causes of Disease This is the starting point of the disease process. It includes all the factors that may cause a disease. These can be Genetic abnormalities These can be inherited, like cystic fibrosis, or acquired, like mutations in cancer cells. Immunologic abnormalities Diseases that arise from problems with the immune system, such as autoimmune diseases. Infections Diseases caused by pathogens like bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. Nutritional imbalances Diseases that result from too little or too much of certain nutrients. Toxins Diseases caused by exposure to toxic substances, which can be chemical, biological, or physical agents. Trauma Physical injury that can lead to diseases or conditions. Pathogenesis Mechanisms of disease This is how the disease develops and progresses after the initial cause. It involves Biochemical changes Alterations at the molecular level that can disrupt normal cell function. Structural changes Physical changes in cells or tissues that can impair their function. Molecular, functional, and morphologic abnormalities in cells and tissues. As the disease progresses, it leads to these abnormalities, which are Molecular abnormalities Changes in DNA, RNA, or proteins that result in cell dysfunction Functional abnormalities The loss or alteration of cell function Morphologic abnormalities Changes in the shape, size, and structure of cells or tissues Clinical manifestations, signs and symptoms of disease these are the observable or measurable effects of the disease, which can include Signs Objective evidence of disease, such as a rash or elevated blood pressure, that can be observed by a healthcare professional Symptoms Subjective experiences of the disease reported by the patient, such as pain or fatigue Normal cell function this refers to the cell's ability to maintain a stable internal environment, known as homostasis, despite changes in the external environment. Adaptation When cells face stress, they try to adapt by changing their structure or function to maintain viability. Adaptation is a protective response to avoid injury. Types of Adaptation Hypertrophy Think of muscles getting bigger with exercise. The cells increase in size due to more work. Hyperplasia Similar to planting more seeds to get more plants. The cell number increases in response to a stimulus, like hormones. Atrophy Picture a cast on a limb making the muscles smaller. Cells shrink because they are not being used or aren't getting enough nutrients. Metaplasia Imagine a worker changing jobs to cope with new demands. Cells change type to handle stress better but could become abnormal or even cancerous over time. Progressive impairment. If the stress is too much or too damaging, cells can't adapt and instead get injured. This injury can be reversible, they can recover, or irreversible, they die. Sequence of reversible cell injury and cell death. Homostasis, cells in a healthy, stable environment. Adaptation, cells coping with stress. 
Think of it like working out to get stronger. Reversible injury, like a sprain, the cell can heal if given a break. Irreversible injury, like a serious burn, the cell is too damaged and can't go back to normal. Necrosis, the cell dies a chaotic death, often causing inflammation. Apoptosis, the cell follows a programmed sequence to die without causing harm to neighboring cells. Cellular response to stress and injurious stimuli. Cells respond to injury in a variety of ways depending on the nature and severity of the insult. They can adapt, suffer reversible or irreversible injury, or die. Adaptation includes changes like Hypertrophy, cells getting bigger. Hyperplasia, increase in cell number. Metaplasia, one cell type changing to another. And atrophy, cells getting smaller. If the injury is not too severe and is removed in time, cells can revert to their normal state. However, if the injury is severe and persistent, it can lead to irreversible cell injury and eventually cell death through various mechanisms, including apoptosis, programmed cell death, necrosis, uncontrolled cell death, necroptosis, a programmed form of necrosis, or pyroptosis, inflammatory cell death. Additionally, pathologic calcifications and intracellular accumulations can occur, indicating chronic injury. Cells that are least sensitive to hypoxia are typically those with lower metabolic rates and those that can function under anaerobic conditions, without oxygen, for longer periods. Examples include Fibroblasts. These cells are involved in connective tissue formation and repair and are known for their resilience in low oxygen environments. Skeletal muscle cells. They have a capacity to switch to anaerobic metabolism and can use glycogen stores for energy which makes them relatively more resistant to hypoxia. Cartilage cells, chondrocytes since cartilage is a vascular, lacks blood vessels, chondrocytes live in a low oxygen environment and are adapted to survive with minimal oxygen. Cells respond to damage based on a variety of critical aspects, such as the nature of the injury, intensity, severity and duration of injury, the type of cell affected, the metabolic condition of the cell, and the cell's capacity to make necessary adjustments for survival. To adapt. The most vulnerable components within a cell to damage include its DNA, the generation of ATP through oxygen-dependent processes, the integrity of cell membranes, and the protein synthesis. Sequence of events in cell. Injury and cell death. Reversible injury. Cell swelling when cells struggle to regulate their ion and fluid balance, often due to reduced function in energy-dependent ion pumps in the plasma membrane, they tend to swell up. Fatty change the accumulation of lipid vacuoles in the cytoplasm, known as fatty change, typically occurs in cells that play a role in or rely heavily on fat metabolism, such as liver cells, hepatocytes, and heart muscle cells, myocardial cells. Necrosis. Necrosis represents the collective morphological alterations occurring as a result of cell death within living tissues or organs. The fundamental morphological changes stem from two primary processes. Denaturation of proteins. Enzymatic digestion of cell organelles and various components within the cytoplasm. The pathophysiology behind reversible cell injury due to ischemia and hypoxia. Ischemia. Ischemia occurs when there's a reduced blood supply to tissue, leading to a deficiency in oxygen and nutrients. 
This is critical because blood carries oxygen and glucose, which cells need for energy production. Mitochondrial dysfunction. Due to the lack of oxygen, the mitochondria within the cell cannot carry out oxidative phosphorylation, which is a process that produces the majority of the cell's ATP, the energy currency of the cell. This forces the cell to rely on less efficient anaerobic glycolysis for ATP production. Anaerobic glycolysis. With anaerobic glycolysis, the cell produces energy in the absence of oxygen, but this leads to the accumulation of lactic acid, lowering the pH within the cell, which can be harmful. Energy depletion. The decrease in ATP levels affects the sodium potassium pump, NAKATPUS, which usually uses ATP to maintain ionic gradients across the cell membrane. This disruption causes sodium, Na, to accumulate inside the cell and potassium, K, to leak out. Ionic imbalance. The failure of the NAKATPUS pump and the buildup of Na inside the cell lead to an osmotic imbalance. Water follows the ions into the cell causing cellular swelling, known as hydropic change. Calcium influx. The ionic imbalance also allows calcium, CA superscript 2, to enter the cell. Calcium acts as a secondary messenger and can activate harmful enzymatic pathways. Cellular and organelle swelling. With water influx, cellular swelling occurs, and the endoplasmic reticulum, ER, swells. This can result in the detachment of ribosomes from the ER, impairing protein synthesis, and the formation of blebs on the cell surface. Loss of microvilli and formation of blebs. As the cell swells, it loses its microvilli, small projections that increase surface area for absorption, and develops blebs, bubble-like protrusions, which are signs of cell injury. Rough endoplasmic reticulum, RER, swelling. The RER is studied with ribosomes and is responsible for synthesizing proteins, especially those destined for secretion or for use in the cell membrane. During ischemia, when ATP production is compromised, the RER can swell due to the influx of water, a part of the general cellular swelling. Ribosome detachment. Ribosomes are attached to the RER and are critical for translating mRNA into proteins. A lack of ATP during ischemia causes ribosomes to detach from the RER because the process of protein synthesis is energy dependent. Reduced protein synthesis. The detachment of ribosomes from the RER leads to a decrease in protein synthesis. Proteins are crucial for maintaining cell structure and function, including enzyme production, membrane repair, and signaling. When protein synthesis is impaired, the cell cannot maintain its normal functions or repair itself contributing to the injury. However, if the ischemic condition is corrected in time, ribosomes can reattach to the RER, and normal protein synthesis can resume. Processes in irreversible cell injury The characteristic change in irreversible cell injury is profound disturbances in the cell membrane, leading to severe mitochondrial damage and release of lysosomal enzymes. These disturbances result in the cell losing its selective permeability. When the cell membrane becomes disrupted, it can no longer regulate what enters or leaves the cell, making it completely permeable. Increased cytosolic calcium, CA superscript 2, levels are a hallmark of this injury, which in turn leads to the activation of several destructive enzymes. Activation of enzymes, due to increased cytosolic calcium ions. Phospholipases. These enzymes break down phospholipids, PL, which are a major component of the cell membrane. This leads to further cell membrane damage. Additionally, the byproducts of this reaction, Calcium combined with phospholipids, 
can create amorphous densities in the mitochondria, contributing to their dysfunction. Proteases. These are enzymes that break down proteins, including cytoskeletal proteins, leading to cellular architecture collapse. Endonucleases and DNAs. These enzymes break down DNA, causing fragmentation. The random breaks in DNA can be observed as a smear pattern on a gross gel electrophoresis, a laboratory technique used to visualize DNA. RNAs. These enzymes degrade RNA within the cell. Clinical correlation. In conditions such as myocardial infarction, heart attack, and hepatitis, liver inflammation, these enzymes are released into the bloodstream due to cell death and increased membrane permeability. As a result, they can be measured in the plasma, which can be used diagnostically to assess the extent of tissue damage. In summary, irreversible cell injury leads to a loss of cell membrane integrity, resulting in the cell's inability to control its internal environment. This triggers a cascade of destructive enzymatic reactions that further damage cellular components, leading to cell death. Clinically, the presence of these enzymes in the plasma serves as a biomarker for the diagnosis and extent of cellular damage in diseases like myocardial infarction and hepatitis. Due to cell lysis or rupture, cellular enzymes and contents are released into the plasma. Clinical Significance When cells die, their membranes no longer function properly, causing enzymes within the cells to escape into the bloodstream. These enzymes can then be measured, providing evidence of cell death and damage to tissues or organs. This process is a valuable tool for diagnosing various medical conditions. The stepwise process of reactive oxygen species, ROS, generation and the body's mechanisms to neutralize these harmful molecules. Here is a simplified explanation. Oxygen, O2, is the starting point. It's essential for life but can also form dangerous free radicals. Superoxide, O2 times, is the first type of ROS created by the addition of one electron to oxygen, a process that can happen spontaneously auto-oxidation, or be facilitated by enzymes like xanthine oxidase and cytochrome P450. Superoxide dismutase, SOD, is an enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of superoxide into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. This is less reactive than superoxide but still poses a threat to cells. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, can be further broken down into water, H2O, by the action of catalase and glutathione peroxidase GSH, neutralizing its potential to harm the cell. However, hydrogen peroxide can also interact with transition metals like iron, Fe2+, through the Fenton reaction, producing hydroxyl radicals, times O, which are extremely reactive and can cause significant cellular damage. Finally, through processes such as radiolysis, Hydroxyl radicals can be converted back into water, thus ending the cycle of ROS. Free radicals are molecules with an unpaired electron, which makes them highly reactive and capable of causing cellular injury. Types of free radicals and free radical injury. Oxygen-derived free radicals, ROS. These are the most common types of free radicals in biological systems. Superoxide anion. A primary ROS formed during normal metabolic processes, it can initiate further radical reactions. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Although not a free radical itself, it can cross cell membranes and form more reactive hydroxyl radicals under certain conditions. Hydroxyl radical. Extremely reactive and capable of damaging virtually all types of macromolecules, 
carbohydrates, nucleic acids, lipids, and amino acids. Reactive nitrogen species nitric oxide derived free radicals. Nitric oxide, produced by various cells, including endothelial cells and macrophages. It plays a role in cell signaling and can react with other molecules to form more reactive species. Peroxynitrite anion, formed from the reaction of NO with superoxide, it is a potent oxidant and nitrating agent, capable of causing extensive cellular damage. Free radicals from drugs and chemicals. Certain chemicals and drugs can undergo metabolic reactions in the body, resulting in the formation of non-ROS free radicals. For instance, the metabolism of carbon tetrachloride, CCL4, can lead to the formation of the trichloromethyl radical, CCL3 times, which is highly toxic to cells, particularly in the liver. Production of reactive oxygen species, ROS, in cells. Mechanism of ROS production in cells. Mitochondrial production of ROS. As cells produce energy, small amounts of ROS are normally created in the mitochondria. Superoxide formation, oxygen is not completely reduced during energy production, leading to the formation of a superoxide radical. Conversion to hydrogen peroxide, this superoxide can spontaneously turn into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, or be converted by the enzyme superoxide dismutase, SOD. Formation of hydroxyl radical, in the presence of metals like iron, Fe2+, hydrogen peroxide can undergo the Fenton reaction to produce a highly reactive hydroxyl radical. Interaction with nitric oxide, superoxide can also react with nitric oxide, NO, to form peroxynitrite, another reactive molecule. Production of ROS by phagocytic white blood cells. White blood cells produce ROS as a defense mechanism to destroy pathogens during inflammation. Respiratory burst in phagocytosis, in a process akin to mitochondrial respiration, these cells generate ROS in structures called phagosomes and phagolysosomes, termed the respiratory burst. Role of NAD oxidase. An enzyme called NAD oxidase in the membranes of these structures helps produce superoxide radicals. Conversion to other reactive substances, superoxide is then transformed into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, which, with the help of myeloperoxidase, can become a very reactive substance called hypochlorite, HOCl. These processes illustrate how ROS are both a natural byproduct of cellular metabolism and a deliberate product of the immune response. While essential for normal cell function and defense against pathogens, an imbalance leading to excessive ROS can contribute to cell damage and disease. Conditions that lead to an increase in the production of oxygen-derived free radicals, also known as reactive oxygen species or ROS, can result in cell injury due to oxidative stress. Here is a brief explanation. Inflammation and immune response. Phagocytes, like neutrophils and macrophages, produce ROS to destroy pathogens during inflammation, which can inadvertently damage host tissues. Exposure to drugs and chemicals. Some medications and chemicals, especially carcinogens, can lead to the excessive production of ROS, contributing to cellular damage and mutations. Radiation injury. Exposure to ultraviolet light and X-rays can cause the formation of ROS, leading to cellular damage, such as DNA mutations and skin damage. Redox reactions. Normal metabolic processes involve reduction oxidation, redox, reactions, which can inadvertently produce ROS as byproducts. Ischemia reperfusion injury. When blood flow is restored to tissues after a period of ischemia, lack of oxygen, the sudden influx of oxygen can result in a burst of ROS production, causing further tissue damage. Presence of transition metals. Metals like iron and copper can catalyze the formation of highly reactive hydroxyl radicals from hydrogen peroxide through reactions such as the Fenton reaction. 
This can lead to significant cellular damage. Cellular aging. As cells age, they accumulate oxidative damage from dross, which contributes to the aging process and the development of age-related diseases. Understanding these conditions helps in recognizing situations where antioxidants may be beneficial and in developing strategies to reduce oxidative stress-related damage in various diseases. Free radicals can inflict damage on cells, leading to various diseases. They have the potential to trigger cell death through two processes, necrosis, which is a form of traumatic cell death resulting from acute cellular injury, and apoptosis, a programmed and controlled form of cell death. Here is how free radicals can harm cells. Lipid peroxidation, free radicals can attack the lipids in cell membranes, causing peroxidation. This results in the breakdown of the membrane structure and leads to cell damage or death. Protein modification, free radicals can also oxidatively modify proteins, which disrupts their normal structure and function. This can inactivate enzymes and other proteins, leading to a malfunction of cellular processes. DNA damage, free radicals have the capacity to damage DNA which can lead to mutations and potentially cause cancer if the cell's repair mechanisms fail to correct these changes. Essentially, free radicals cause harm by stealing electrons from other molecules, destabilizing them and setting off a chain reaction of damage. This can affect the integrity of cellular membranes, the shape and function of proteins, and the genetic code within DNA.
Antioxidants are molecules that help protect cells from damage caused by free radicals. Free radicals are unstable molecules that can harm cellular structures like proteins, lipids, or DNA. This damage is linked to various diseases and aging. Mechanisms of antioxidant action Spontaneous decay Some free radicals may spontaneously degrade over time without causing harm. Free radical scavenging systems These are the body's primary defense against free radical damage. Enzyme catalase this enzyme neutralizes peroxide, H2O2, free radicals by converting them into water, H2O, and oxygen, O2. This reaction is vital because H2O2 is a harmful byproduct of many normal metabolic processes. Superoxide dismutases, SODs these enzymes convert superoxide free radicals into hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Superoxide radicals are a common type of free radicals formed during oxygen metabolism. Glutathione peroxidase, this enzyme uses glutathione, a powerful antioxidant, to neutralize various free radicals, including peroxide, H2O2, hydroxyl radicals, and others. It is particularly important in reducing oxidative stress in cells. Exogenous antioxidants. These are antioxidants that we obtain from our diet. Examples include vitamin E, vitamin A ascorbic acid, vitamin C, and glutathione. They help neutralize free radicals and reduce oxidative damage. Endogenous antioxidants. These are antioxidants that our body produces. Iron and copper, although necessary for bodily functions, can catalyze the formation of reactive oxygen species, ROS, when unbound. To prevent this, they are usually bound to storage and transport proteins like transferrin, ferritin, and celluloplasmin. Superoxide dismutase in the brain. This enzyme is critical in the brain to protect it from free radical injury. The brain is particularly susceptible to oxidative damage due to its high oxygen consumption and lipid-rich content. Fenton reaction. This is a chemical reaction leading to free radical generation, particularly when ferrous ions, Fe2+, are converted to ferric ions, Fe3+. This reaction is important in understanding how unbound iron can contribute to oxidative stress. Understanding these mechanisms is crucial for comprehending how our bodies defend against oxidative stress and the importance of antioxidants in our diet and metabolism. Enzymatic antioxidants. These are proteins that directly neutralize free radicals. Superoxide dismutase, SOD converts the superoxide radical into oxygen and Hydrogen peroxide. Catalase. Converts hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, thus preventing the harmful effects of H2O2 accumulation. Glutathione peroxidase. Uses glutathione to convert harmful peroxides into water and alcohol. Non-enzymatic antioxidants. These are usually small molecules found in our diet or synthesized by the body. Exogenous. Obtained from the diet. Vitamin E, a fat-soluble vitamin that protects cell membranes from oxidative damage. Vitamin A, another fat-soluble vitamin that scavenges oxygen radicals. Ascorbic acid, vitamin C, a water-soluble vitamin that can neutralize a variety of reactive oxygen species and regenerate other antioxidants. Suffidril-containing compounds, includes cysteine and glutathione, which have Active thiol, SH, groups that can reduce free radicals. Endogenous, produced within the body. Serum proteins, such as transferrin, binds and transports iron, ferritin, stores iron, albumin, maintains osmotic pressure and also binds various substances, and celluloplasmin, binds and transports copper.